The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Hi everyone, I am uh, Zach Seifs. I work at Appalachian State University. I'm a software developer there. I do a lot of Drupal stuff. I do a lot of Node.js, a lot of Python, a lot of Bash scripting, a lot of pretty much everything. And um, today, I'm going to talk about continuous deployment, or as you might know it, continuous integration um, with Drupal, Agar, Git, Fabric, and Jenkins. Um, Fabric isn't in my original description for my talk, but it was, and I took it out, and I added it back in because I wrote this really cool little thing with it, which we'll talk about later. But um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so about me, I work at Appalachian, like I said. Um, we have over 300 instances of Drupal that makes up our most of our web presence. Most of it is in a single, a single Agar instance where we have multi-servers split off. So we'll have our development instance over here with a remote Agar instance, and we'll do everything there, we'll just move it around. It makes it really super cool to do that. Um, I write a lot of Drupal, Django, Node.js. I have a project called the Open Blog Project, which Shrop talked about and a bunch of people really dig, so it's kind of cool. I'll actually be demo demoing some stuff on that too. So overview. Why is continuous integration important? Um, what are some of the tools we can use? And what are some example workflows we can do? And a little live demo, because why not? <laughs> Should be able to push some code. So what will continuous integration do for me? Why is it important? Well, it's really important because every time you run, every time you make a commit, whatever service you're using to watch your repo and go and build the instance, you have the ability to run your unit tests. You have the ability to run Selenium tests, and you have the ability to make sure that the code you're pushing out will work, and it will be stable enough so you don't have any weird bugs creeping up on you that you don't find, that you could normally find with continu continual integration. Um, let you automate everything. I mean, basically, all I do now is push to a, a, a repo, a branch in my, in my repo, and all the changes, and the changes just happen because I have Jenkins and everything else in place doing this. Um, and it helps keep your production code base current. So you're not worried about, you know, oh, I'm running 6.2.5 in development, and I'm running 6.2.2 in production. You don't have to worry about that, because everything is synced up. Because, you know, you're building everything off distributions. You're building, you know, everything is based on a make file, so it's all kind of the same. And Agar manages a lot of this stuff for you. It's really cool. So. I don't, don't remember what my next slide is. Okay, so now let's start talking about the tools we need. So I don't know how many of you guys use Git, but Git is a really awesome distributed version control system, and it makes branching and merging and, and you know, rebasing using remote origins, using subtrees or submodules if you're still using an older version of Git. And it makes doing this stuff really cool. It, it lets you use um, workflows. I don't know how many of you guys have seen um, there's something called the successful Git workflow. I always talk about this. If you Google it, you'll find it. It's a really cool way of managing your, your source tree and breaking up everything into logical groups. So, you know, for instance, you have your main develop branch, which is where you do all your changes to your code base. And you would never, you always commit to there, and you always break off feature branches or bug branches from that, and then you merge that into stuff. So you have your master branch, which you've never committed to, except the first commit, because you kind of have to. And you just keep merging stuff in, so you end up with this tree that, I wish I would have took a picture of this, but it's like all these different lines going up, everything's merging into one. And you kind of build out this thing where you can, you can say, you know, only stable code, only tested code lives in the master branch. And you can also make Jenkins do this. You can make any kind of continuous integration server do this. You can have it automatically commit like after tests are, are ran or, or whatever if you don't want to do it on your own, but we kind of do it on our own. Um, there, and you have all kinds of great tools and all that good stuff. So the next thing, Jenkins. I don't know how many of you guys know this, but it's, a, it's amazing. <laughs> it's um, a Java-based continuous integration server. Um, I know Java is kind of scary, but this one actually works. <laughs> and it's, uh, it works really well. It's just kind of a memory hog sometimes, because it's Java and all that good stuff. Um, there's a large selection of plugins, and I'll be talking about a couple of them that I use here. Um, you can have remote 
Jenkins instances. So we have our master instance right here. We have Ned and we have Ned2. So both of our remote instances do different things. This one does all the building, this one does a lot of testing. So you can kind of split up your tasks and then once the task is ran, it doesn't have to run on the, the master server anymore. So it can run on one of the slaves. So then, and it's just awesome. And it's, it's just like cron. I mean, basically it's, it's like cron, but you have a lot more options and a lot more awesomeness. <laughs> so, Acre. I don't know how many of you guys do use this, but it is super cool. The, 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 basics part, the basics of Acre is two things. You have the back end and the front end. The back end is called provision. It is what handles all of the, all of the tasks, you know, creating VOS files, creating, uh, uh, managing where Apache does stuff, where your sites live, your um, building stuff, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and you have Hostmaster, which is our front end, which is the Drupal side. So if you ever see a, a Agar site, that's Hostmaster. You can have multiple Agar sites pointing at one provision I found, which is, seems pretty cool. Um, and the one thing in between them all is Drush. So, Agar is basically built around Drush commands. It uses Drush aliases to store contextual information about the site. It uses, um, I mean, how many of you guys have used uh, Drush update DB? That's, that's a command that came from Agar. It's, it's one of the coolest things they've done. And then they're starting to push in a lot of other stuff. Um, it's built around uh, Drush and Drupal multi-site. Now, the thing that differs between an Agar site and a regular site is an Agar site is a multi-site. You have your site's default, and normally you have your site's default, whatever. This time it's sites, your URL, and then everything else. So you have this long thing, and I'll kind of show it to you in a little while too. I should have put a demo up there, but um, it's pretty cool. Um, and it actually, it stores information about each different kind of, um, kind of content, kind of entity in the, in the application through, through the uh, context. And there's only a certain number of entities. There's sites, platforms, um, servers, packages, installed packages. There's a bunch, and they're all nodes. So you can do whatever you want. You can use the node API to kind of mess with stuff and do kind of cool stuff. So it's crazy. It's really just crazy extendable. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit more about provision. Provision is the back end. And it's really just super simple. It just kind of hangs out, does all your configuration stuff. Um, the way you interact with it is the same way you would interact with any kind of Drush command. And you can even write aliases on your own system and then have that interact with your remote one. But basically, I mean, you say Drush your, um, the name of your context and the command you want to run, and it'll do it. So if you use Drush um, and then grep for provision or hostmaster, either one, it'll show you all the options that it has in your Agar instance. And you can do, you know, you can do sub commands with the dollar sign thing and all that good stuff. Okay, and this is an example of a, of a context, which essentially is a more structured um, trust alias, trust site, site alias for a site. So you have your basic, you know, your name of your site, it's a key to Ray, so what kind of context it is, the platform it lives on. The cool thing about servers is that it represents servers the same way it represents sites. So a server is a, a server has a context. A uh, site has a context, a platform has a context. Everything has these little things describing each other and you can reference them in it with different things. So I could say the DB server is at server localhost or I could say the DB server is at server, you know, MySQL one dot whatever, where it is and it can do that and automatically figures this out. And this is all done without the front end's involvement. This is all in the back end. I mean, you can host a full on Agar infrastructure without Hostmaster. It's, it's completely decoupled as long as you can write, or I mean, yeah, you can just run commands like Drush, um, I think it's Drush save alias, will do this, or no, that's the name of my command. I'll show, that, I'll show that to you guys later, but this is all created by Drush. Just run like three or four commands and boom, done. So, next thing, talk a little bit more about Hostmaster. Hostmaster is what, you're, what people who are using your Acre instance will see. You know, what someone who, you know, if you have a client you give access to, you want them to be able to back up their stuff or do whatever. If you would ever give clients access to Hostmaster, I wouldn't. But if you have 
like for instance, we have um, the designer I work with. She is the one who builds most of our sites. She's the one, she goes in there, creates a site, does all this stuff, and it's so easy. And this is what Hostmaster does. It lets you do this and lets you let people manage their own stuff. So I'm not the one who has to go and create a site every day. You know, I don't have to go through my Redmine tickets and say, oh, okay, I gotta create this, this, and this. I could say, okay, here, here's how you do it. And you know, you're, you're dealing with normal Drupal users too. So you have roles, you have permissions, you have all kinds of cool stuff. It's, it, it's a Drupal site that you're using to manage everything else. Super cool. And it's extendable, because you're just writing modules. And all you have to do is like write a Drush INC something. And then you can expose it to the, to the uh, back end and then grab all the data. So next thing. I don't know how many of you guys are really into like Python and Pythonic stuff, but um, Fabric is one of the coolest things in the world um, for doing uh, system admin tasks. It's, a, it's basically a library that wraps open SSL and a bunch of other stuff and lets you run commands either locally or um, on a, an uh, external service that do stuff. Like, so if I have something that goes in and starts, restarts Apache, I say, you know, SSH, whatever, at whatever, dot appsafe.edu, and then sudo slash services, all that good stuff. This I can just say, well, I can import the run or the sudo um, from, the, from the Fabric API and then say sudo restart Apache, and it'll do it. It's super cool, and you can run it on multiple hosts. You can run one task on multiple hosts like I'm doing here. You say fabric dash H, and you can just, it's common delimited, so you say localhost prod one, prod two, and it'll go through and it'll run the tasks out on it. It's really super neat. And um, I wrote a little, a kind of a little um, a wrapper thing for dealing with, uh, agar, with, with for dealing with um, agar sites, and I'll show that in a second. It's kind of based on MIG-5's thing, which is just amazingly cool. But Fabric is really, it's, it's pretty much what ties the room together. It's, it's just amazing. It makes life so much easier. So now let's talk about workflow. What is actually gonna happen when we, when we start our site? So the main thing you're, you're looking at is the developer. The developer is the key to this. One person doing one thing and then pushing their code out. So the developer here makes their changes on the develop branch, merges their changes in the master, runs the unit tests, and pushes it up. And if they, before, you know, if they don't run them before they merge it into master. So they push it up to the git repo. Then Jenkins comes in. Jenkins will pull the repo. It's, it's, I wish it had like a pub sub capability, but it doesn't. So you have to use polling to go look for changes. And when it sees a change, Jenkins will automatically start building jobs. It just does this all on its own, super cool. Then if it succeeds, it fires off the next jobs. Because you can have jobs that are parameterized, and you can have jobs that are, are parameterized that trigger other jobs that are parameterized and pass parameters around. Super cool, kind of cool thing that I figured out about two days ago. But you basically start doing that, and if it fails, you can make Jenkins harass whoever broke the build. That's what I do sends emails, hops in IRC, just starts making fun of people. But uh, you have, it, it fails and it tells you, it emails everyone and, and it doesn't trigger any of these other jobs or you can make it trigger jobs that would happen on a failure. Say you have build job here failed, but you have another job that emails all the devs and one that goes through and tries to do something else. So you can do all kinds of cool stuff with chaining jobs and, all kind, and that kind of fun stuff. And that's the end of my presentation part. So now, let's actually make this happen. Um, what, I've, what I got here, what, are, what I have here, is, let's minimize this, is a change to, I, I don't know, I, I mentioned open blog earlier, but I run my, my site in it, and I run a couple of other things, and I have a change that I wanna push up. Actually, first let's do this. So this is my Jenkins instance. Um, this is hanging out. I have four jobs in here. I have my build, my deploy for OpenBlog US in my site, and I have a GitHub mirror, which I just kind of like to do because I don't really like leaving my code in one place. I just want to mirror it around. Um, but what I have with this job, and I have a couple plugins enabled and I'll show you, 
um, is there's one call there's one plugin called Parameterized Builds, which lets you have different parameters you can pass to your to your um, job when you're trying to run it. So I'm grabbing the site name. I have a default value. You can leave that out. Um, I'm grabbing an agar, which is the server name for the agar instance that I am managing all the sites on. I'm grabbing the build name, which is pretty cool because you can also include um, variables, uh, Jenkins variables, and say, you know, I want to have this called open blog, and this will be build like 33 or 34. But you can have that, and you can come down here to the bottom, and you can trigger other jobs. See, I have one. I have this one triggering my um, deploy and for my deploy for my site. And you can also pass that parameters, and you can pass it parameters that you passed the original job. So you can keep just sending this whole line of parameters down. And you, you can actually pass, there's a whole bunch of other options. So you can actually pass current build parameters. So if you just want to leave that in there and just pass them all down through the, through the thing, if you don't want to change anything. Um, you have a properties file. Um, you can pass through stuff about the git commit. Um, I don't know what the restricted matrix execution to a subset is, but you can do that if you wanted. There's all kinds of cool stuff. And you can also, oh yeah. And I'm also triggering the GitHub build on a stable, stable release. And the other thing about Jenkins is these are all shell scripts. This is all bash, pretty much. And actually, yeah, because I'm, I'm telling it to run in bash. Um, and it's just super easy. I mean, all you do is point it, point it where you want to go, and then bam, it runs. So what it runs is this. This is a project I've sort of been working on. It's, sort, it's really like MIG-5's um, deployment scripts. If any of you guys have played with that, it's basically continuous integration. But it's sort of, it's weird because it sort of depends on the build number to determine if your site exists or not. Well, what I want to do is say, if it doesn't exist, create it. Or if it does, just migrate to it. Because you can, what you should be able to do here, and which is why this code block right here exists, which is hacky, very hacky if you're doing this in Python. What you should be doing is listening for a system exit exception and then catching that and then doing something on there. But because Fabric doesn't, it doesn't return values properly, um, it doesn't, actually it doesn't return the exit code properly like from system error, it just throws it out there and you can't really catch the proper one. In, in newer versions, they're working on fixing this. But you can just say, you know, if the result failed, do this. So this is basically a lot of fabric. It's really super simple. And if you come down here, like the build platform task, these are, these are, shell, these are um, commands that you would run in a shell. I mean, really. You say, make the directory, drush make. You tell drush where it is, provision save, all this good stuff. And this runs, runs through and builds your platform, migrates, all that good stuff. So you can kind of build these commands out and just do all kinds of cool stuff with, with this. So, and then we have our, our Acre instance with all of our sites on it. So pretty simple. So let's see. First thing we're going to do, um, with the Jenkins, you also have the ability to pull Git repositories, which is what I was talking about earlier about looking for changes and then grabbing them. So what we can do here, we can change the schedule. This is really kind of bad for Drupal.org, but I don't care, and I mean every minute. So what this will do, it'll start pulling for changes every minute. So, and what we can do, we can make a change. So I'm gonna make a change to the 7.x branch. I have I have this change. What I did, I'm a big fan of consistency with my layout and stuff. Right here where it says monthly archive, it's capital letter, lowercase letter. Right here, capital letter, capital letter. I don't like that, that needs to change. So what we can do, because this is all built out in features and everything, we can just change it in the feature. And what I've done here is I have one little change, and you guys can't read that, I just changed the, the, le the, the letter. So. Uh, let's make sure I'm the right user first. Cool. So let's make a commit. And 
and hopefully, ooh, I spelled that wrong too. I'm sorry about my spelling, I'm not great. So it should have pushed the change up. So now, let's take a look over here. Now, if we wait a minute, it runs every minute. It has the same kind of, um, uh, same kind of limitation as cron, where you, it's not a Damien, and you just run it whenever it wants to run. So it should pick it up soon. I don't have, eventually when it decides. And actually, this would be a cool time. You guys have any questions or anything? Because I know I've been talking a lot, and any kind of questions? <laughs> Uh, Appalachian, we run our own hardware. We have uh, two physical boxes, and we use uh, VMs for our development and staging servers. But for the most part, we do all of our own hardware. We don't really virtualize yet. We're looking at it for um, maybe building clustered, um, like, uh, like behind a load balancer, Agar instances, and then have them all connect to an NFS share and share data that way, or maybe something cool like that. But for the most part, it's all, ooh, look. It's building, okay, cool. It has started building on its own. <laughs> so, but yeah, hardware is cool. You do need a lot of hardware with this. And I'm just saying you probably shouldn't run this like I'm running it now, because I'm running it all in one Linode 780, 768 thing. And I'm running Varnish, Agar, MySQL, Apache, <laughs> Jenkins, all that fun stuff. So this might, might crash, we don't know. So, the fun thing about this, and where it gets, to the point about continuous integration. So what we have here is you can see what's running. You can see that it didn't see the platform. It failed. So we're gonna start running the, the Drush Make. So here it's building out the platform, downloading everything. And this is all done, like, this is all pretty much out of the box Jenkins. All I have is the parameterized builds. I have a plugin that lets me name the, name the builds. And I have one that changed the, changes the little um, green balls right here. They're normally blue, but I don't think that's a really great color for this because why green is good, red is bad. <laughs> so this thing is going out building. Okay, it's done. So the first thing it does, it runs the simple tests on this because we have, I've got a couple hundred, like it, I think there's 166 tests at the end. It takes a little while because it goes through and bootstraps Drupal 7 and does all that good stuff, but right now it's going through and running all the tests. So that should, it actually takes like two minutes to do this. <laughs> but it's one of those things that you just kind of watch and you're like, okay, it's building, it's hanging out. It's doing its thing. And you can see all of the output from the drush commands. Normally you would see this in, the, in Agar where you have, where you would have, let's see, in this view, Oh, it's slow because stuff's happening. Yeah, all the output here is displayed in Jenkins real time. Well, it's actually not as verbose as this, but, and actually we should be able to see our new platform has been created and our first site, our testing site has been moved into it. So let's go back over here to Jenkins. It's still working. It's still testing, hanging out, doing its thing, being Jenkins, <laughs> but yeah, and this is one of the big things. It's, it's, it's a lot of hurry up and wait and stuff, but. What's the benefit of uh, the building just straight up faster and being able to execute on multiple servers at the same time? It's just easier. It's yeah, it's the same thing. I have, I have another, one, another one of these scripts that I used to use at Appalachian that would let me do this at all in bash. It was just a lot more to write. You have to do a lot more error checking and you have to, there's stuff you can't do over you know, SSH. You have to go actually go on the box and run it as a certain user. It's kind of weird. So this, this lets us, ooh, it finished. So this lets us do all this stuff really simply. So it looks like all the tests have passed. We have 166 passes, zero failures. It's cleaned up and it's actually, and it's already started the other build. So we're changing open blog and we're changing my site. So if we come over here, it's already building. And Twitter should have already updated. So it's now building these two jobs and because we passed the name of the platform along in an argument or in a parameter, we're going to have, hopefully this will go to the right thing. And yes, it did. So it noticed that the platform there, and there we go. So we have deployed code, and let's see if this changes. Hopefully it will. 
Cool. So there we go. The P is now lowercase. Boom. That's, that's continuous integration. And that's, that's going through, making a change, checking your work, making sure it still works with everything else, and then deploying it if it needs to be. So bam. No, I lowercased them. <laughs> I lowercased the P. Because <laughs> I first letter, yeah, it's one of those things. But yeah, so that's, that's that. That is basic, basically how to build a continuously integrated environment. And if you want, I would please feel free to go grab these scripts. Um, I'll put a link, I'll probably tweet it, and I'll probably put it on my uh, page for the talk and everything. And let's see, what else? I have my presentation. So, learning more about this. Um, these are the basic sites, you know, community agar project, Jenkins, docs.fav file, git SCM. But there's like, you can go to Google, um, there's a couple really cool Reddit sub subreddits about, you know, there's programming, there's Drupal, and there's all kinds of stuff about, you know, this sort of thing. So, and Googling, you know, IRC, um, on Freenode, we hang out in Drupal NC, so if you have any questions, want to talk about it, we're there. Um, but yeah, if you guys have, do you guys have any questions or anything about what I just did and how to do it? <laughs> I know I talk fast, what's up, man? Yes, um, if in, let's see. Uh, yep, so we have a full array of test suite, or a full test suite that's going through and checking for all this stuff. So you have all the assertions, you have, you know, making sure that the toggle logo is off and. So the hundred and something tests are the test view logo. Yes, yeah, before. yeah, because I'm in, let's see, where is this? on this script in the build, I'm actually passing a variable to the fabric command, telling it what test to run. And you can actually run multiple ones. And you have options, is, is, there's like a dash dash all, and there's something else where you can say, you know, which module do you wanna run? So I can say, I have, let's see, test open blog, content default settings. I could say drush run tests dash dash URI, give it, give it a, valid, um, no, a valid name, and then slash, I think it's dash dash module something, and then just say I wanna run test open blog content default settings, or instead of running all the tests on your application. So it's pretty cool, and simple tests because it's built in Drupal 7, so much easier than dealing with Drupal 6, because Drupal 6 you have to build a, build a a platform, then patch it, then do all this other awful stuff, and it's just so much easier. So, yep, it's that. So, anything else? Yes. No, I tend to leave those around for at least a couple days, just in case something happens I need to go back. Because we, we try at, at Appalachian, we leave it around for a week, just so we have the time to go back and fix any changes. So if, if like, when they updated services to 3X and we have stuff that depends on 2X, I didn't realize it at the time. So I updated everything, broke all the stuff, rolled back, and it lets you do that very easily. Agar is super cool about that. It generates a backup before it does anything. It goes through and makes sure all of the modules match. Cause, so I can go, Let's break something, let's see what happens. Let's try migrating this to a platform that may not be able to migrate to. Oh, another thing, Drush lets you, lets you uh, lock your platforms. So locking is a good way to make sure no one breaks stuff, no one adds or deletes stuff while, you're, while it's running. So we lock everything, but it's gonna go through and unlock this, and you can try to migrate stuff to different platforms, and, it'll, and if this one doesn't match what it is, It'll tell you, it'll give you warnings. It'll say, you know, this module and this module aren't compatible. You need to fix that sometimes in later versions. <laughs> so as soon as this runs, it does take a minute.
Yeah, we have, I have, um, let's see, I, I basically use find and then say for everything in um, the, the backups folder, older than eight days, because we have on our servers, we keep eight days worth of stuff and we keep 30 days on tape. Um, so I just have a find script that goes and deletes all the back, all the stuff that's old that doesn't need to be there. And Agar goes through and cleans up the platforms too. So if I delete one from inside of Agar, it should go through the file system and clean all that up. So let's, it should, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes if you don't, if you create custom, um, custom platforms and give it a different name, so if you use like dashes instead of underscores, it will create two different contexts for it and only reference the one that's right. And it's just a mess when you try to clean it up because that's the first thing I ran into when I was first playing around with Agar. Um, let's see if we can migrate this. No, it still won't. Okay, so it's pretty good at, at, at realizing, you know, this doesn't have the um, open blog profile of, available to it, so I'm not gonna build it. So Igor's pretty smart about that. So it's all kinds of cool stuff. Is there anything else? Matt? We have, we have implemented something we call Update Tuesday. Every Tuesday, updates go out automatically. So we have, um, we do a code freeze on either Thursday or Friday, so that's when we start testing. And then Monday, we do a final test. Tuesday, we launch it live, and then it kind of, the cycle kind of, we have a couple days to fix stuff, and then the cycle starts over, all over again. It's pretty cool. Um, it's sort of the way that, um, a, 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 long, a while ago, I read a blog post that it, uh, either Facebook or Etsy did where they were talking about their deployment process and they're talking about how you know, they have this full-on scheduled thing that you know, every Tuesday, all the updates are, all the updates are scheduled to go out. Um, some sites, some, apparently like Facebook is individual instances of a profile, I don't know how they built it, but it's just the way that they push their stuff out it's better to schedule it. And I think that if you're gonna do this in any kind of major production environment, you do need to schedule it. You do need to say, you know, this is when the code, this is when we're gonna freeze our code base, and this is when it's gonna go out, and then anything made after this date is gonna go out the next week. So a lot of it's, a lot of it's um, managing how you, how people work with your stuff. It's a pretty cool concept. Anything else? I know I've kind of went through this really fast and it's like 20 minutes to go. What sorts of uh, hardware do you need uh, to schedule and launch? What are some of those requirements for you to make sure that Well, the main, the main thing you have to worry about is separating Jenkins and your front ends. You don't want to run them on the same box because Jenkins is pretty um, memory intensive. Um, I mean, I'm viewing this on a 512 Lin node and it works perfectly. I host a couple Drupal 7 sites and a couple Drupal 6, which are kind of weird. Um, I know the, the VPSs that the hot Drupal dude does can support it really well. He does a lot of cool stuff. Um, I mean, as long as you're splitting up your main processes. I mean, ideally you would have Jenkins box, uh, varnish front end or whatever, whatever caching server you're using, Apache, and then another box for your MySQL. So all of your major processes are split up so you're not worrying about disk IO collision and not worrying about you know, having to share resources on a single box. Now, some things, the way things are set up where I work, <laughs> it's not conducive to that environment, but ideally you would really want to kind of split those things up because then you can start, you could have your front ends all attached to an NFS share or something, and then you can start load balancing them and you can kind of build out this, in, this whole environment. And I know in like Igor 2 and, and later versions, they're working on making multi-server multi, multi like clusters, or I think what they're called. They're making that a lot more easier to do. So you basically just point a bunch of machines. I mean, this way is just awesome. I mean, but you can just basically point it at a machine and then it goes off and does its own. Same way with remote acre servers. Like you have one instance and then you just say, you know, as long as it can SSH and you open up a firewall, a firewall hole and you open up MySQL to be able to connect to it, you can do anything. It's super cool, it's super fast. And you can manage multiple servers from one. So let me see, I can kind of show you. So let's see if this is, 
I may not be able to get to this not on, if I'm not, oh, I can. So this is our main production instance for ASU, and there's gonna be a bunch of stuff in here because I haven't cleaned it out in a while. But as you can see, 264. <laughs> so this sort of whole thing runs on that. But with remote servers, we have our dev environment, which is separate from everything else. And what you can do is just say, you know, what IP address, what port is it running, you know, and in here I believe you give it a host name and an IP address. So that's as simple as it is to build these things and to kind of have a fully clustered environment and it's all controlled from this one Agar instance. So that's that. <laughs> and that's, um, that's pre pretty much what I got. And you had a question, didn't you? you really don't experience any downtime. I mean, it, there's a couple seconds when it puts the site into maintenance mode, and you can tell it not to. But it's your normal amount of downtime when you're running updates and stuff. But the thing is, it takes time, and I have seen my servers just, the load averages is like 30 <laughs> when I'm doing these big, massive migrations. I mean, we have 185 sites on one platform. So you're trying to move all those around, and it gets kind of, kind of takes a while, and it took like, God, it took like six hours one day to do it. Just sitting there watching, it's like, okay. And occasionally stuff will fail. Like you'll have really big sites that are just be like, oh, I don't wanna do this right now. We have a couple that are about two or three gigs. And you know that's because other stuff. And people wanna put files everywhere. Because <laughs> it's an academic institution, you have to be able to you know, put your work up and share it. So we deal with that. We deal with a lot of really large sites and it takes a while and some fail. And the best part about this, if it fails, it doesn't stop serving the original site. So it'll try to migrate, but it'll go back. Super cool, makes life so much easier. So, yeah. Anything else? Well, awesome. Thank you guys. <laughs> it's been great. Um, if you have any questions, I'm on, um, I'm on Twitter, I'm not Zach. Um, and I'm in, I'm on Drupal is not Zach, Drupal.org is not Zach. And if you wanna try open blog or commit anything, let me know and I'll be happy to take some patches and such. <laughs> so I appreciate it guys. <laughs>
uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature-rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack well, management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. 
I don't see any limits to the clouds tag.